Meaning is so fundamental. Somebody can lose their legs, their arms, and find a new meaning in life, a new purpose, a new adventure. Other people feel like a victim. So meaning is the only real way, ultimately, to not be a victim to what happens to us. With us is Dr. George Kohlreiser. George is Distinguished Professor of Leadership and Organizational Behavior at IMD Business School in Switzerland. Welcome. Great to have you with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Jacob. Thank you so much. I would like to spend the next few moments talking with you about the role of Secure Basis in facing life and professional transitions. Um, how would you think about that? Well, first of all, I think we have to go back and understand the way the brain is working so that transition could be a threat, perceived as a threat, and Secure Basis give that sense of safety. It calms down the brain. And then you can start seeing it differently. You can start connecting with people differently. And the big challenge with transition is seeing the benefit that comes beyond all the losses that are happening. So sometimes the loss is obvious. Sometimes it's secondary. Sometimes it's anxiety producing. But secure bases are fundamental to help create the foundations to feel that protection, that safety, to explore whatever's going to come out of that transition. Yeah. So secure bases and transition seem to play a, a, an important role together. So what do you learn from secure bases and, and what are secure bases actually? Well, secure base can be anything that inspires. It can be a person, a place, a goal, an object that gives that sense of protection. So in a transition, there is change and change in and of itself is not naturally resisted. It's the pain of the change, the fear of the unknown. So a transition involves letting go of something and moving towards something else. And in that transition, we have to be able to develop a new mindset, a new emotional framework, and a new way of behaving depending on what that transition is. So if I listen closely, you're actually saying people don't naturally resist change. Correct. People do not naturally resist change. But they resist the pain of change and the fear of the unknown. Okay. So the pain of the change. Maybe we could focus a little bit more on that. So in what way does grief then play a role in transitions, both well, professional and personal? Very, very much, because it depends what the primary losses are. You're changing jobs, you're changing country, and then it flips over into personal changes, so it adjusts the way you are with your children, your family, and so forth. And understanding that you are letting go, you are saying goodbye to something, and you cannot really say hello until you fully say goodbye. And in that transition, you're going from this place to that place, and it's not so clear always what that transition is. So sometimes there's a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of uh, 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 change that is not clear where you're actually going. So the more clarity you can get, the better it is. A secure base is sort of that objective person or that uh, objective place or goal that helps calm yourself. Because the worst is when a transition produces too much anxiety, mm -hmm. too much worry, too much of these negative emotions. So Secure Bases actually teach you how to not to worry too much? Well, they allow the possibility. It depends what you do. No Secure Base can in and of itself take away that worry unless you let the Secure Base have an impact on you. And that we know is the person effect, the ability to be affected by someone or something that gives that sense of safety. Okay, and having a sense of safety, which is needed also to say goodbye, I'm curious, what, what does it mean saying goodbye? How does that look like, really saying goodbye? It means going deep into the emotions of the grief. So it can be anger, it can be sadness, it can be fear, it can be seeing something in a different way. Um, and so 
letting go is one way to describe grief. Grief can also be that deeper emotion that happens when you really profoundly let go of something. You retire, you change jobs, you move countries, you're in a merger and an acquisition. How you handle that grief depends on how much importance it has to your own identity. Yeah. So many people will maybe argue, especially in a professional context, well, grief, that's really a heavy word to talk about something that is changing. Yeah. Well, how would you react to that, them saying that? I would say, wake up, smell the coffee. That grief is part of life. And there's a lot of loss in organizations that go denied. Pe managers, leaders don't recognize the underlying grief that's often, ha often happening, the hidden griefs from everything f changing offices to getting new leaders, changing teams, closing down projects. I mean, just think of what all the possibilities are in just change of roles, for example, and how does someone go through that and then find a new way of connecting. In the end, it's about connecting and grief stops the connecting process stops the bonding process and how would we see that in an organization if there's a lot of hidden grief uh, how, how oh you would see it by disengagement you would see it by levels of sickness or illness you would see it by sometimes aggressive behavior you would see it by being unable to perform at your maximum level It shows up in many, many subtle ways, physical, uh, emotional, social, and performance. So would we then be, say someone is facing a merger and acquisition or, or a, loss, a job loss, and he's seeing a coach, what, what should the coach address with that client then? First of all, understand the pain. What is this change going to mean to you? What are you losing? What are you saying goodbye to? What are you letting go of? The biggest problem in change management processes, Jacob, is that the leaders want to sell the benefit. The coaches want to sell the benefit without fully understanding the pain someone's going to go through. And very often the person has trouble putting words to that pain. So understanding, if I listen closely, is more than theoretically understanding. It's oh, really absolutely. allowing it's, your client, your... It's your... empathy. It's compassion. It's being able to put words, which some people don't have, to express what they are feeling about a change that's happening to them. And I think it may sometimes be quite a challenge for a coach or for a leader to really ask that question, what is painful for you? Because they may be afraid of when I ask you what is painful, that you might start crying or get angry. So what will you do then? Well, painful is just one word. So another word is word would be, what are you losing? What are you going to miss? What will happen when you no longer are doing such and such? So it doesn't have to be painful directly, but what is it that's affecting you that you're saying goodbye to? And that becomes a nice, gentle expression. What are you saying goodbye to? Well, I'm saying goodbye to a boss. I'm saying goodbye to an office. I'm saying goodbye to a company whose name I've been loyal to for years. I'm saying goodbye to a product that we no longer are going to use. I'm saying goodbye to service and, and, and giving customer service, and now I'm going to be doing something different. Yeah, so it's exploring the different types of way, the, the different ways people express what they are losing, yeah. and finding words, putting word yeah. to it. Yeah. yeah. And then at some point, be able to switch the conversation. Well, now, what is the opportunity? Yeah. What what is going to happen that is positive from this, but not before you fully explored the negative. Yeah, because that would be a question then. So for instance, I'm asking the word exploring and someone then and he, he, he starts crying and saying, wow, well, like, actually, I don't know. I'm, I'm really feeling sad now you're asking me all these questions. Then, then what should we do? Ask what they're sad about. What are you missing? Do not back away from it, okay. but not, don't necessarily over provoke that feeling. So. Why are you having tears? What, what brings tears to your eyes? What is it that you 
want to say about what you're going through. And what should then the coach or the therapist or the leader who is dealing with these teams, what, what should he or she learn about him or herself when dealing with these issues? Well, I think empathy means that each time you take a gift or you take some awareness, you take some useful learning that comes as a result of what the experience your client is going through or the person you're coaching or working with. So it's not a detached approach. It's the ability to say, okay, I understand what is going on here, but not necessarily be, do you have to say what it is you are learning. I mean, as you reflect, what does this mean for me? Hmm. So it is an interactive process between the client and the coach, between the, the uh, co-worker and the Sometimes. student. Sometimes, not, not necessarily so overt, because the coachee is there for the coachee. So you don't want to switch the focus from the coachee to the, the coach. But it might be a byproduct. A learning it could for be yourself. a byproduct. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you for that. So we're talking about secure bases. Um, and I, I'm curious, what, what is then the basic behavior of the secure base? What, what, are, what are the things he should do, he should not do? Well, that's a very good question. A secure base, number one, should remain calm. So being able to help someone feel comforted so that their emotions come back into perspective. And that doesn't happen if the coach is not able to be calm in their own emotions. So you have to be present as well. You have to be present. How to be able to switch the mindset from the negative to the positive, ultimately. If you listen to the pain, at some point there's a delicate moment to switch to the positive. And you say ultimately so that I'm hearing also don't go too quick. No, no. That, that's one of the biggest mistakes is driving too fast for the benefit of a change without first hearing what the pain of the change is. Yeah. And then being able to bring it back to a learning. What can you learn from this? What does it mean for you in your life to now go to a new job, to a new position? You've been a team member. Now you're going to be a team leader. You did this, and now how is this going to be a learning? And then understand how to use language. So the coach is also teaching the person effect through language. How do we talk about something? So many people do not talk about what they're losing because they use so many words it gets distracted. Or they don't respond to questions about what is going to help them go deeper into a deep dive of what they're feeling. So language becomes part of it. And w would that be then some words you would typically rather not use when you have a dialogue on, on loss and transition? Yes, but. <laughs> Don't use yes, but. Because what, is, what does it mean if you say yes, but? It, it's a block, it's a discount. It's, it's putting a barrier between you and the other person. So if you want to object to something, do it in a straight way. And I think in dealing with coaches and leaders who help people through transitions, straight talk is very important. You don't want to mask it with sugar coating. But how do you say it straight, not too painful or direct, but not too much avoidance? It's a, it's a real skill to say something with straight talk. And one of the great characteristics is when somebody says their leaders talk straight. I can believe what he says, because what comes out of that is trust. So it's, it's, it's a subtlety, um, using the right words at the, at the right time, staying connected. You seem to be the master of it, so I'm really curious. How did you learn that? Well, I learned it, first of all, uh, growing up on a farm. We didn't have time to spend a lot of time talking about something. If you had to do the milking of the cows or you had to harvest something in the field, it was pretty direct. And then as I went through my professional career to be a hostage negotiator, it became fundamental as a hostage negotiator. Talk straight, simple questions, look for direct answers, be able to engage and connect at that very subtle level.
that's necessary. So it's a deep listening skill. It's a deep listening skill that is based on the ability to ask questions, but ask clear, single sentence questions. Mm -hmm. Be able to paraphrase that in the listening, that you can repeat it. And then giving choices. Is this what you mean? And understanding how, in that paraphrasing, they can see something in a different way. Yeah, to learn to create another perspective, to have another perspective on, on the same things. Absolutely. What, what is for you a role model in, in doing that, in, in creating, offering choice or learning to deal with, with a choice? Uh, there were many in my career. Carl Rogers was the master. When he spoke, he spoke straight. He's often made to appear to not be by his non-directive counseling, to not be direct. He, he meant by that compassion or empathy. Mm -hmm. So when he would say something, he would say it from the heart. Uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, Eva Reich, there were many people along my career development. James Lynch, who was wrote a book on the language of the heart and how words became so important in understanding blood pressure and the person effect. So this was all built around the use of language and being able to talk to people, connect at that deeper level. So with Jim Lynch, it was, how do you create that cardiac orienting reflex? And many people, when they talk, they provoke a, fe a, a flight, flight response. They feel threatened. Yeah. They feel pushed back or somehow not trustworthy. How do you create that cardiac orienting reflex, which is that deeper emotional bond of two hearts coming together? So would it be safe to say then that bonding is really about bringing the words and the heart together as a whole experience, that your words flow from the heart? Yes, that's true. That's one form of the bonding. So you can be bonding with someone that you are in an adversarial relationship and get that connection. It, it has to do with the connection and those special conversations and dialogue where you, you feel the oneness, you yeah. just feel the depth. Yeah. So while we're talking about transitions, what is the role of meaning? It's very important because it is the inner intrinsic sense of the value you find in something. So somebody who is taking a new job, the meaning may be they're building a career and the money that comes with that career or what happens with that career. For another person, the meaning has to do with what kind of value they can contribute. So in a transition, you're going from one place to another and you're finding another meaning. So if you are retiring, what meaning do you find in being able to be retired? If you have something come to an end in your life, a dream, an adventure, and you find a new adventure, a new dream, what is the meaning you find in that? At a personal level, if you lose a spouse, you lose someone to a health crisis, what is the meaning that you find in what happens to that. Meaning is so fundamental. Somebody can lose their legs, their arms, and find a new meaning in life, a new purpose, a new adventure. Other people feel like a victim. So meaning is the only real way, ultimately, to not be a victim to what happens to us. So not to be a victim. Uh, so what is what has been a moment in your life when you had to choose not to be a victim and to really search for meaning? Well, when my son died uh, in 1993, that was a very key moment to turn to a secure base, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, colleagues, friends, to find meaning ultimately over time in his death, not to feel like a victim but to turn the loss into an inspiration. And that would be just one. Another could be as you move from, I moved from the United States to the Europe to live over here. What was the meaning I found in working over here? What did it mean to leave 
something as familiar as the country you're in. Can you elaborate on that? I'm curious. What did it mean to leave the United States to live in Switzerland? Well, I was very interested in culture. I was very interested in all the different aspects that came in knowing people who thought different, saw things different. And those people listening to this who are expats, they know what it is to be an expat. You can be a happy expat, finding meaning in doing different things. Another would be to be miserable, to miss your country, your motherland, or deal with kids who are expat children who are not happy in the new country. Hmm. So it's always choice. What is the meaning or purpose that you find in the new uh, transition? So it sounds also a little bit, if I'm correct, like finding your true calling in life. Well, can be, but not necessarily, because some transitions are parts of a chapter in your life, are parts of another adventure that you're living. But ultimately, the big transitions are where you're moving from one calling to another. So is leadership then also about knowing the chapters of your life, thoroughly knowing them? Absolutely. And being Absolutely. able to talk about it. How are you building? What is the foundation? And how does each chapter build on the other chapters? How do these new experiences lead to other new experiences? And what can you learn from past experiences that can help you in the next one? Wonderful. And the chapter you are in right now in your life, what is beautiful about the chapter you are in? Well, having created at IMD the High Performance Leadership Program, which is running now for almost 19 years, over uh, 85 sessions, over 5,000 people having going through the program, the chapter is what to do with all of those positive results. People love the program. They talk about, talk about it as transformational. And so as I look for a new adventure, I'm looking to what I can do for youth leadership. How do we bring the principles of high-performing leadership to youth? Why is that important? Well, it, it's important because the next generation of leaders is, is critical. And you don't automatically become a leader. You have to go through the wiring, the, the mindset. Or to help leaders who retire, who move out of uh, positions in organizations and use their wisdom to help in coaching and help in helping advise other people to be able to look for parts of the world like Africa or some parts where leadership is not developed. How do we bring leadership into those areas? There's sort of still a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to do. Leadership is still in its infancy. And what keeps you inspired? Uh, it's seeing people change, seeing people go through the process of finding something new. And that whole idea that, okay, when there is resistance, how do I help people change their mindset? change the way they connect and how to bring them together. Beautiful. And when you bring them together, is it then also important when we have transitions to have rituals? Yeah, I think so. I think rituals are very much a part of being able to do something that helps symbolize that we're going from one place to another. We're going from there to here. And how would you do that, for instance, in a team when they get a new leader? What would be... Uh, uh, well, you would have the old leader, if they're so uh, understanding to do that, to come in and introduce the new leader, to ask for people to support that. It's doing a, a, a ritual of being able to say thank you for something, saying goodbye to something, saying thank you, saying hello. It can be a, a, an outing of some kind. It can be... Uh, a, a retreat, a passing a baton. There are many things that you can think of that are symbols. And they create memories as well. Yeah. Yeah, so that you can look at together. You yeah, I, I think one of the other things about transitions that's so important is your history is as it is. You can't change whatever happened in that history, the timing and so forth. 
but you can change your interpretation of it. You can change how you make choices in the way you feel about it. That you can change. The actual event, it's history. You cannot change it. So transition, grief, having secure bases help you to, in a transition, focus on, on the future rather than be stuck in the past. Focus on the benefit of the future and not be stuck in the past. That's saying it very well. Thank you so much. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having with us. And um, I hope you will have many more moments in which you can share with all the leaders your wisdom and your experience. Well, thank you. And to all our listeners, whatever the transition is that they're going through, take time to say goodbye to what it was. It's over. Say hello to the future. And do that in not too fast a way and certainly not in too short a way. So timing becomes very important to ultimately live life with joy in an adventure. And a transition creates an opportunity for a new adventure. Thank you so much. Thank It's a pleasure to be here. Us.